Okay, thank you everyone for, for coming to this today. Um, this is a presentation that I like to call Putting Your Best Voice Forward with Parkinson's. And today we are going to be discussing uh, what are the communication and swallowing issues that are typical in Parkinson's? Um, what, are, what causes them? What creates them? Uh, what are the treatment and exercise approaches that can help to remediate them? How do you get started on one of these programs? What are your options for intervention? And then how do you stay diligent with doing these um, regularly for the rest of your life? Because we know with Parkinson's, uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. You got to keep everything moving, keep all parts moving. And that includes your voice and speech muscles as well. So Parkinson's, as you probably all know, is a neurodegenerative condition that impacts motor movement. And that is due to a loss of neurons in a part of the brain called the basal ganglia. And these neurons that produce dopamine all of a sudden become uh, not as readily available. And dopamine is a uh, chemical messenger in your brain that controls movement. So the most common uh, motor um, symptoms of Parkinson's are of course the tremor, uh, stiffness or really rigid, rigid muscles, slowed movement, uh, and what's um, probably the most prevalent is smaller movements. This is often called the disease of low amplitude. And we'll see as we go through this presentation that it applies to absolutely uh, every function in the body uh, from walking to arm swing, to voice, to speech movements, to swallow. Things become reduced in size and amplitude, which uh, can be very, very concerning. Uh, and lastly, difficulty initiating movement, getting those, um, getting those muscle movements started. So changes in movement can also affect speech and swallowing muscles. They are not exempt from the dopamine deficiency. So the most common uh, speech issues that we hear about are slurred, mumbled speech, not being able to articulate clearly, uh, probably the number one complaint that we get is a really quiet voice. So reduced loudness, uh, reduced prosody. So prosody, when you think of prosody, think of anything that makes your speech interesting and engaging to the listener. So changes in pitch up and down with your voice and your speech, um, uh, exaggerating stress patterns, saying certain words with a little bit more gusto, pausing in your speech for effect, uh, all of these things are prosody of speech. I like to think of it as the musicality of speech. And those are the things that, that make our speech interesting to the listener. Without prosody, our speech can become very flat and robotic, which of course might not be as interesting to your conversation partner. Uh, changes in actual voice quality can occur from a breathy or harsh, hoarse voice quality. Fast or quick little rushes of speech. So controlling the rate of speech. Uh, sometimes it's referred to as festinating speech, which is little bursts of, of quick, rapid um, uh, words coming out all at once. Hesitant speech, not you know, being able to initiate the speech sounds that you want. Uh, also with, re with respect to communication, there can be a decrease in facial expression. Uh, you've probably heard of masked faces or hypomimia, and that's referring to uh, reduced range. Again, it all comes down to that reduced amplitude, that low, um, that low amplitude of movement. The same happens with facial muscles. So normally when we're speaking, we are very animated and our eyebrows go up or we open our eyes a bit wider. Um, you know, we smile, we frown. All of these things can become um, uh, less with Parkinson's, which results in that very uh, flat facial expression. And of course, uh, swallowing can become a problem as well. So difficulty uh, chewing certain foods, controlling food in the mouth, transferring it to the back, initiating the swallow and getting it to go down the right way into the, into the food tube in the stomach. 
Parkinson's disease, again, low amplitude, also can reduce your ability to think clearly and can affect those areas like uh, your ability to attend to something with lots of focus, uh, your working memory, executive functioning. So those are all those higher level things like organization, uh, really abstract thought, all of those things that uh, help you to, um, to think and function in the world in a very high level way. So the studies uh, show that the language changes that we see in Parkinson's are typically linked to these cognitive changes. So if your cognition, your underlying cognition becomes a little bit uh, less or reduced, well, that's going to affect your ability to um, have a clever comeback, to think of the right word in the right circumstance, to, to put together the, the right feeling and expression of, of what you want to say in a coherent way. And we all know that communication is key. It is the way that we interact with the world. It's what keeps us social. And when I say communication, I don't just mean speech and voice. I mean body language, facial expression, gestures. All of that is how we communicate with our environment. Uh, and this is actually a low statistic. 89% of people with Parkinson's worldwide experience communication changes. The studies actually show that in the later stages of Parkinson's, it's closer to 100% of people with Parkinson's will in some way have some trouble with their speech or their voice or their ability to communicate. But only three to 4% of these individuals with Parkinson's receive speech treatment. Why is that? Why is the number so low? Uh, number one, uh, just lack of education. Um, our physicians and neurologists uh, some of them are fantastic about referring for physio-occupational speech therapy, and others are not so great at that. Some are just basically med management, tweaking high-low. So access um, to specialists and individuals who can refer you to these, um, to these speech therapists. Um, can be uh, a limiting factor, as well as your location. If you live in a more remote area, if you um, happen to not have a speech ther therapist near you that, that has this kind of expertise working with adults with Parkinson's, uh, that can really impact your ability to, to access treatment and intervention. Parkinson's medication, while highly effective for many of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, has shown, been shown to have very little effect uh, on improving speech and swallowing. Uh, the only thing that I would say to contradict that would be that when your Parkinson's medications are tweaked to you know, your best setting or dose, and you are taking them regularly, of course, um, speech and swallowing, those movements are probably going to be a little bit smoother, uh, easier initiation, uh, not so much sort of uh, choppiness with the, with the speech and swallowing. So if your medications are um, optimized for you, then you're probably going to speak and swallow a little bit better during those times. But does it actually help with the, with the quiet voice, with the mumbled speech? Uh, the swallowing difficulty, not directly. So why? Why do people with Parkinson's speak so quietly? Why do they mumble their speech? Um, why do they uh, maybe not have uh, as good of um, chewing and swallowing ability as individuals that don't have Parkinson's? Uh, it all comes back to what I call a faulty feedback loop. This lack of dopamine in the brain um, actually tricks your brain into thinking that you're making normal sized movement. And keep in mind that when I say movement, I can be referring to arm swing, length of your, uh, of your step, the, the, the movement of your mouth muscles, the amplitude of your voice. Parkinson's tricks you into thinking that you are making good big movements in these areas, but it's false. It's a perceptual mismatch. So someone with Parkinson's that's speaking at this level of voice might feel that they are really projecting their voice. Their brain is telling them that they are. And in fact, just a little anecdotal, one of the number one complaints that we receive from uh, clients working with clients with Parkinson's 
is the individual saying, I think my, my spouse or my partner has a hearing loss. They're telling me I'm mumbling. They are telling me that I am not voicing loud enough. And I am, I'm practically shouting and they can't hear me. So it's, it, um, and all, quite often the spouse will have to get their hearing tested. Turns out their hearing is just fine. But in the individual with Parkinson's, it's that faulty feedback loop. It's the, it's the brain telling you, okay, move your arm uh, in a swing like this. Yep, that was a good job, Bob. You did it. You did it just fine. When really you're only moving it this much, or that that big step you think you're taking actually only results in a little step. That big voice that you think you're making, that clear, well articulated speech that you think you're making, your brain tricks you uh, into telling you that it's a okay when in fact it is reduced. So if you can get behind that idea first then the treatment for all of these issues makes a lot of sense. So here, um, actually, here is a, is a really handy little diagram. So here we can see someone um, voicing with a very soft, soft, normal, uh, loud, or a shout. And hopefully you can see my cursor. But the person with Parkinson's might be kind of in the soft range, but their brain is telling them they're up here. So again, it's that, that faulty feedback loop, that perceptual mismatch. Um, so the to overcome that, of course, here's a little um, um, spoiler alert. You have to make things bigger than feels comfortable or necessary. So in um, speech exercises, voice exercises, treatment and intervention, we instruct people or train them to speak up in this area, not at a shout, we never wanna strain the voice, but feeling louder than feels necessary. Uh, and it will probably come out more at a normal level. The person will think that they're being very, very loud when in fact, they're just uh, coming out at that good normal level of loudness. Uh, interestingly, voicing issues are often one of the first things that people notice with Parkinson's, uh, even before tremor, stiffness, rigidity. They'll say, yeah, for years and years, I've just had this really quiet voice. Uh, facial masking can also be an early sign as well. Just, you know, people saying, are you okay? You, do, you don't look very happy. Uh, are, you, are you depressed? And the person with Parkinson's saying, yeah, I'm fine. I'm totally fine. Thinking that they're expressing and showing big emotion on their face. But again, perceptual uh, faulty feedback loop. They are here when they think they're here. So all areas of language. So when we talk about speech and voice, we talk about the motor output um, of what we're saying. Language are the words, the, the, the actual sentences and words that we put together. Uh, so there can be language, um, slowing of language production in Parkinson's, but not in the same way that happens with stroke. With stroke, um, there is uh, lack of blood flow to a certain area of the brain. And if it happens to hit, um, you know, your expressive or your receptive language centers, then, you know, you can have dif difficulty understanding or expressing yourself. That's not what's happening in Parkinson's. What's happening in Parkinson's, as I, I mentioned before, is just this general slowing of cognition that happens. And of course, cognition underlies our ability to speak coherently and fluently and, um, you know, with ease. So the, you know, the trouble finding words, the trouble coming up with the right thing to say at the right time can be from that underlying uh, slowing of cognition. So we've touched on this before, but just to go back to that idea of um, the reduced amplitude also affecting facial expression, there can be that um, faulty feedback loop again, where you think you're expressing big facial movement when really you have more of a flat uh, masked facial expression. Uh, so what's important to think about with facial masking is what are the social emotional impacts of that? If every time you spoke to someone, they showed no facial expression, they really weren't able to um, be big, happy, um, uh, sad, disgusted, angry, you, it would look quite flat and robotic and the, the communication, the person that's communicating with the individual with Parkinson's might wrongly assume 
that that person is not engaged in talking with them. They're not interested when that could be absolutely not the case at all. So what can happen is this sort of detachment where person with Parkinson's doesn't show much facial expression, the communication partner, you know, I, I don't think they want to talk to me. So they withdraw. The person with Parkinson's sees this person withdrawing and becomes um, self-conscious and again, starts to withdraw. So it's this vicious cycle of, um, of um, feeling like the person is not engaged in conversation. And if you stop interacting with people, if you stop attending social events, if you stop speaking up at the dinner table or at the, the coffee talk, whatever you're at, that can have some pretty devastating um, results as far as increasing depression, anxiety, and that is the last thing that we want. With, with Parkinson's, you have to stay socially engaged. You have to keep talking. You have to keep communicating. Uh, so it's important to have those honest conversations um, with loved ones and friends about what it means that, that maybe what you're saying um, and what you're showing on your face isn't matching what you're really feeling inside. So on to swallowing. So swallowing uh, issues can become as prevalent in Parkinson's, especially in the later stages, not so much in the early to mid stages. But again, it all comes back to difficulty initiating movement, difficulty um, controlling and coordinating, uh, not making movements of um, the mouth and throat as big as they used to be. All of that can result in um, difficulty swallowing in one or many phases of the swallow. So the, the danger of, of uh, getting um, issues with swallowing that, that go untreated is it of course can lead to poor nutrition um, as well as developing what's called aspiration pneumonia, which is when food liquids medication makes its way down the wrong way instead of the stomach, it goes into the lungs. And of course, the bacteria that's attached to all that food liquid medication colonizes in the lungs and can create a pretty nasty infection, which can be treated, of course, but um, it's something that you want to avoid if, if possible. So catching it early, treating them, knowing the signs of aspiration type pneumonia can really decrease uh, the likelihood of any complications. So just a little checklist of, um, of some signs and symptoms of swallowing difficulty, uh, losing weight without trying, uh, having trouble with thin liquids, water, juice, pop, anything that's really liquidy, the feeling of something being stuck in your throat, uh, uh, having difficulty controlling saliva, drooling, food pocketing in your mouth when it never used to before. Uh, the biggest ones are coughing, of course, choking, uh, during or after eating and drinking, heartburn after a meal, sore throat, uh, getting, uh, having trouble moving food from the front to the back of your mouth, controlling food and liquid in your mouth. Is there a lot of food spilling out when you're eating and drinking? It takes you a lot longer to eat a meal. It's difficulty swallowing pills when it never was difficult before. Um, eating habits have changed. And then uh, and the last one is changes in voice quality after eating and drinking. And the reason why we put this one in here is that if you have something go down the wrong way, if you have something go down the wrong way into the airway instead of the food tube, it has to pass over the vocal cords. Anything that passes over the vocal cords, of course, that's gonna change the sound of your voice. So you might get quite a, uh, get quite a wet, bubbly, gurgly sounding voice, especially when drinking liquids or any food item that has a liquid portion like a soup or fruit cocktail with syrup or a really juicy piece of watermelon. So uh, if you have any of these signs and you haven't already sought out a speech pathologist evaluation for a, uh, for a swallowing, clinical swallowing evaluation, please do that. You do not wanna let this go. So oh, just gonna move my banner out of the way here. So here we get to the part of the presentation that I think is most important. We know that all of those things can happen, but number one, what's most important, what can we do about it? Do we, is there anything that we can do about it? And luckily the answer is absolutely yes. The research shows that people with Parkinson's still retain a significant amount of neuroplasticity. You can still make changes and improvements in speech and swallowing. 
if you think about why things become weak, does Parkinson's cause facial muscles to become weak? That's what's causing the, the, the lack of facial expression. The answer is no, it's not like a stroke where there's just um, that part of the brain is damaged. The, the weakness in the mouth muscles and the throat muscles and the, uh, and the facial muscles stems from not using them. When you are, are only making little tiny movements with your, with your mouth to articulate, with your tongue and your throat when you're swallowing, uh, with your voice when, you, when you're speaking, then those muscles aren't being used as they should in their full potential. So if you don't use it, you lose it. Um, there's a disuse atrophy that sets in. So what you need to do is go back and start exercising. And yes, you can exercise your speech and swallow muscles, thankfully, uh, in a very specific way, uh, making things big and exaggerated to overcome any weakness that is set in and to recalibrate the brain to make from going forward to make things bigger, uh, to fight against that low amplitude that's occurring from the lack of dopamine. So uh, research has shown that the best combination for communication changes in Parkinson's is optimized medication regime. And that depends on, on your uh, neurologist or um, specialist that you're seeing. And then speech therapy or exercises. So the aha moment here that I want you to think about is why do speech pathologists manage both speech and swallowing issues? And the answer is because it's the same system. It's the same anatomy, same muscle groups, same movements. So speech and swallowing functions use the same system. So if you're doing uh, Parkinson's specific exercises that address the respiratory, the breathing, the phonatory, your ability to voice, and the articulatory, the mouth movements to, to speak clearly, you are making improvements in both your communication and your swallow function. So I don't know about you, but I like a deal. So if you tell me that I can do one set of exercises and I am benefiting two, two different systems in the body than I'm in. So two for one deal, the, these exercises address both communication and swallowing. So the research shows what should this therapy or exercise consist of. It should be intensive and repetitive. There should be a focus on loudness or rhythm. There should be um, an, an aim to recalibrate the brain so that this perceptual mismatch is no longer occurring and increasing your awareness and perception of deficits to know when you have to overcome them. The first and most well-known direct therapy approach for Parkinson's is, of course, the LSVT Loud. So LSVT stands for Lee Silverman Voice Treatment. Um, most of you, I'm sure, have probably already heard of this. Uh, they are out of Colorado. Uh, they've been around the longest, uh, developed in 1987. They have uh, years and years of research behind them. Uh, the LSVT Loud program is intense repetitive focus on sensory calibration with one singular focus of thinking loud. So that one focus um, to um, train your brain, to recalibrate your brain to be louder than feels necessary. So the research shows that it improves vocal loudness and quality, intonation, you know, those nice ups and downs in speech, uh, speech intelligibility, facial expression, as well as swallow function. And I forgot to mention at the beginning that I uh, don't feel that you have to jot everything down. I have a really handy four page clickable handout that uh, you are welcome to have at the end of this presentation uh, that has clickable links to all of the things I'm talking about. Anytime I talk about a program or a therapy model, it is in this handout along with a few other bonus things that I'm gonna throw in there. So LSVT Loud is very intense. It is four sessions a week, four one hour sessions a week for four weeks in a row, 16 sessions total in one month, as well as daily homework uh, activities to do. So on the days you have therapy, there's a little bit of homework. On days you don't have therapy, there's even more homework. So it is a big commitment, but the reason why it works is that it is so intense. The second um, direct therapy approach I'm going to speak about is from Parkinson Voice Project. 
and it is the speak out method. This one uh, is a little bit less of a time commitment. It is uh, two to three times per week, 45 minute sessions, uh, up to 12 sessions in total. And they, it is based on a series of increasingly difficult voice, speech, and cognitive exercise. The focus with the speak out method is speaking with intent. So speaking with purpose, with focus. There's a really cool science behind it that, that when we use the automatic system in our brain to do something, um, and that would be something like um, breathing, doing something that's so automatic that it's rote for you, even driving home from uh, work on a familiar route. Sometimes you could just kind of zone out um, and you get home and you go, how did I get here? You were on automatic pilot. So when your body is on automatic pilot, the, the pathway goes through the dopamine deficient basal ganglia. So stay with me. Which means that what you're doing is impacted by lack of dopamine. With the speak out method, <clears throat> you are speaking with intent. So you are now, you are now bringing on the um, non-automatic system in the body, which means that what you're doing is intentional, purposeful, it requires thought. That system does not pass through the dopamine deficient basal ganglia. So when you use that intent, when you do something, when you speak, when you're, when you're doing an activity, you uh, have the benefit of not having that dopamine deficiency in the way. Hence, um, speech is clearer, louder, which of course takes some training to do. We do tend to fall into automatic speech patterns because that's just what's easiest for our brain. So it is always, always thinking about doing something in a very intentional way that, that this therapy uh, works in that regard. These uh, specific protocols like LSVT loud or speak out are not the only option. Some speech pathologists um, prefer to put more of an individualized program together. They might pull from different um, programs and concepts uh, based on the uh, presentation of their, of their client. Uh, they might uh, prescribe certain breathing, speech, voice, cognition, language exercises. Uh, and this is just a more individualized approach, and that's uh, perfectly fine as well. Uh, SLPs are trained to assess and treat a variety of speech, voice, and language impairments seen in PD. Uh, so it just depends on the person that you're seeing which approach they would, they would use. So I wanted to bring up the idea of telepractice and that we're used to the model up until now of going into the speech clinic or going in to see a speech pathologist for our sessions um, in person. Well, 2020 has put a bit of a damper on a lot of in-person activities because of COVID, of course. So what's becoming an increasingly popular uh, method of service delivery is telepractice. Telepractice or teletherapy has been around for years to reach people in more remote areas that don't have access to in-person therapy. But of course, now with the COVID situation, it is becoming pretty much the norm now to, to see a therapist via telepractice. And the good thing about Parkinson's specific speech therapy and exercises is that it works really, really well online. Uh, usually the individual with Parkinson's and up until the very late stages, cognition and attention re remains pretty good. So they can sit in front of a computer and they have the person in front of them, either doing the therapy or guiding them through the exercises and whatever, um, um, approach that they're doing. So it's therapy that's delivered securely online. Um, the benefits, of course, are that you don't have to leave your home. You can be in your jammies and get your, your speech exercises done. Mobility issues are not a barrier. If you've got any difficulty getting around, that's no longer an issue. There's no travel time for the client or the therapist. We can reach people in more remote locations, of course. And uh, being from Canada, often in the winter, road conditions can be pretty horrific. Um, so you don't have to cancel a session just because it's a blustery, miserable, icy day out there. So telepractice. Uh, another benefit is that if you are looking for a speech therapist that is specifically trained in one of these methods that I mentioned, you are no longer limited to someone that's within a 30 mile radius of your home. If you live in New York City, you can see, or sorry, from New York State, you can see a therapist 
anywhere within that state, whether they're two hours, three hours, or 20 minutes from you. So that's the nice thing about the telepractice model is that it opens up uh, a lot more variety where before that wasn't, that wasn't the case. I myself am certified in LSVT Loud as well as the Speak Out method and have had great success with both of those programs. What I find is the challenge is after that four weeks of intense therapy is done, there is a plan put into place and a handout given saying, okay, now you have to do these 15, 20 minute speech exercises on your handout every day for the rest of your life. And that's just what it is with Parkinson's. It, the exercise never stops. You have to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it. You don't use it, you lose it. So this is where most people fall off. They do wonderful during therapy. They make amazing gains. They go home and, you know, maybe they do their exercises for the first week or two and then things get in the way and then it becomes out of habit uh, and eventually it falls off and they lose all these amazing gains that they've made. Also, dopamine itself is one of your get up and go motivational neurotransmitters. So to be, to be able to self-motivate yourself every day to do your exercises, whether it's physical or speech exercises, can be a challenge. I know myself, I don't have Parkinson's. And for me to get myself in the right mood to do a 30, 40 minute workout, that takes a lot of, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, so this, this is where I find the challenge lies with a lot of these speech therapy programs. Now there are post therapy maintenance groups called loud crowd and loud for life for both of those programs They're once a week. Um, and they're usually in person in a church basement or at a facility where you can practice your speech exercises together, but not everyone lives close to one of those groups to access. And it's only once a week. You need to be doing these exercises every single day. It has to be regular and intense. I wanted to create something that addressed this issue of not staying compliant with daily practice. So what we have here is the Get Loud, Stay Loud Parkinson's Speech Exercise Forum. What it is, is a team of speech pathologists that um, live streams eight to 10 sessions per week. These are about 20 to 25 minute sessions typically of Parkinson's specific speech, voice, swallowing, cognition, linguistic exercises. You can see here all the classes that we offer. We do offer a speak out class. We offer an LSVT loud class. We offer a music uh, voice class, facial expression class, uh, articulation class. So you just tune in, you follow along. Uh, to the therapist on the screen to get your voice and speech exercises done. Now, keep in mind, this is not direct therapy. This is not, you've had an assessment. Um, now there's a plan set out for you. This is tune in and follow along guided speech and voice exercise. So I'll send you a link to this one as well. If anyone's interested, anyone can try it free for 30 days, see if it's a good fit. Uh, and if not, no obligation. So what are these um, speech and voice exercises typically? What do they, what do, what, what is involved in them? And how do you uh, maintain loud, clear speech and improve swallow function in Parkinson's? As I said before, the answer is regular. It has to be regular voice and speech exercise. If you don't do it regularly, you will lose your ability to voice, speak clearly and swallow well. These are what are included in many of these speech um, voice exercise programs. And keep in mind, they all vary. They all have a different approach. But in general, um, this are, these are the things that are targeted. So breathing exercises, learning to breathe from the diaphragm, knowing to take a nice uh, inhalation, a big belly breath to safely power um, a loud voice. You don't want to be straining the vocal cords. You want to, you want all the power to come from the diaphragmatic breath. Vocal amplitude exercises. So these are uh, typically long sustained vowels with good voice quality. So you can try it with me at home if you like. It might be a nice big breath and then hold a 10 second ah, like ah, like that, okay? 
Uh, and again, lots of repetition. Pitch exercises, not just to get good intonation in the voice, uh, but also laryngeal movement, which is uh, what happens when you change your pitch, um, are very, very, very important in swallow function. When you swallow, your laryngeal muscles, your throat muscles have to move up and forward out of the way of the path of the food. Those are the laryngeal muscles at play. Pitch exercises actually work on that laryngeal movement. So you, again, you get that two for one, the benefit of the pitch exercises addressing the flattened intonation in the voice and also improving movement for better swallow. Articulation exercise, it might be poems or limericks that you say with very over articulated speech, big mouth movements. You'll notice a theme um, in Parkinson's speech intervention that everything is bigger. So exaggerated mouth movements, exaggerated louder than feels necessary voice, exaggerated facial expression, uh, which leads me to facial emotional expression or exercises. Not just doing isolated facial exercises, but doing them uh, functional emotional exercises like I have one here actually. This is, I'll, I'm going to give you this game at the end too. It's attached. So uh, taking a sentence like, there's cheese on this pizza and saying it with happiness. There's cheese on this pizza. Say it with sadness. There's cheese on this pizza. Anger, there's cheese on this pizza. So you can see my facial expression changes, my um, voice, speech, tone changes. So, and these are things that you can exercise, that you can actually work on. So don't worry, I will give you that, um, that game. It's a dice game in that little handout at the end. Uh, lastly, cognitive linguistic exercises. So exercises that really test your brain, that make you think, that, that, um, that improve your memory, that improve your underlying ability to attend, to come up with words, to create sentences. So all of those types of things are as important, I think, that, than the voice and the speech exercises. We want to be loud and we want to be clear, of course, but we also want to have something to say and we want to have that attention and that ability to have that conversation with our loved one and be able to... Um, really excel in that area. My favorite quote of all time is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So early intervention. So just because you maybe are not experiencing too many uh, issues with facial masking, quiet voice, uh, slurred speech, doesn't mean you shouldn't be working on it. If you have a diagnosis of Parkinson's or a suspected diagnosis of Parkinson's, start right away. It is much, much, much easier to prevent decline than to start here and then have to start and make gains from, an, from a point where you're already experiencing deficits. So early, 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 absolutely don't hesitate. Don't wait until it becomes a significant issue. If it is already a significant issue, um, get on it as soon as possible. You can still make amazing gains. So how to stay diligent? How do you stay diligent? Either you've done um, an LSVT or speak out or an um, uh, individualized program with your speech pathologist, and now you just have to practice at home, or you don't have access to direct intervention, but you want to start a home program on your own. How do you stay diligent and motivated? I came up with this acronym, which I call SMART. So S is for schedule. Uh, put your speech exercise time, this 20 minutes, in your calendar. Treat it like any other appointment that's important, dentist, doctor's appointment, and then show up. If it's in your calendar as an appointment, you're more likely to do it. M stands for make it a priority. You always have time for things that you put first. So I always say do it first thing in the morning when you've had a good rest, your voice is at its best. Um, and you're more likely to do it than if you let it go to the end of the day. A is for accountable. Make people keep you accountable to doing your speech exercises. Tell people about your commitment to doing this and then ask them to check in with you. Uh, and if you know they're going to be checking in with you, you're more likely to do it because you want to be able to say, yes, yes, I did do it. Uh, R is my favorite. I'm all about rewarding myself. Uh, so make sure that you have a reward set up each time you do your speech exercises. 
Um, maybe you make a nice cappuccino or maybe you let yourself have a little Netflix binge immediately after you complete your exercises. But if you know there's a reward coming, you're more likely to do it. And team, make sure that you are surrounding yourself with positive motivational people. Most of us are part of some sort of Parkinson's support group. If you have a buddy in mind, find a speech partner and arrange to do your exercises together or at the same time. And then you can check in with each other uh, and say, did you do it? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, virtual high five. Um, next day, same thing. So I also have this smart... Um, um, handout in that four page uh, clickable handout that I mentioned. Okay, so before we get into any questions, and um, I'll have you either type out your questions in the chat, or um, uh, you can unmute yourself and just ask me in person. But I just wanted to let you know what this clickable handout uh, includes. Links to find LSVT Loud or Speak Out clinicians in your area. There are search tools that you can actually use on their websites. Uh, a handout, one page handout of a home voice and speech practice um, suggestions or program that you can do. There is a video of the normal swallow explained in very easy to understand terms so that if you understand what a normal swallow is, it's a lot easier to understand what could go wrong um, uh, in Parkinson's. There's also a video of a four minute swallow fit where you exercise the back of your tongue, which is very important in getting a good strong swallow. That facial expression dice game. Uh, there's a copy of that that's really fun with the instructions on how to do that. The smart goals handout. I have a, um, I'm always asked about dry mouth. <laughs> it's a big, big issue with Parkinson's. So I have a dry mouth uh, handout with lots of suggestions on how you overcome dry mouth. And then of course, a link, if you'd like to try the Get Loud, Stay Loud um, speech exercise program, free for 30 days, you are welcome to do that. And we'd love to have you.